All right, so before we get started tonight, one of the things that we have to do is whenever you have a famous trio like we have with us tonight, you have to give them a name, you know? Think about some of the famous trios in rock and roll pop music history. We have Destiny's Child, so that name's already taken, all right? The Bee Gees, ZZ Top, ZZ Top. Maybe. We may come up with an alphabet soup name. The Eamon, Sup- Eamon would be better. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, the Supremes? That, well, that was a girl band, so we probably don't want to do that. I'm thinking that we give this group tonight uh, the nickname The CEOs, since you're all the CEOs. That would be a good rock music band for this group. So you guys are the CEOs tonight, and that's how you can reference them in all your tweeting and whatever else you guys have going on out there. And with the CEOs, hashtag the CEOs tonight, and then whatever other hashtags you want to put on there. Y- y'all know what hashtags are, right? <laughs> okay, all right. You don't get it at uh, you don't get it at IHOP. Okay, it's it's not it's not a meal. All right, so we're going to talk a lot about leadership tonight. I have prepared some questions for these guys to to go through, share their thoughts, because it is a rock star lineup that we have here. I would not have come all the way to El Dorado if it weren't to be with these three guys and all of you. So I just think this is a phenomenal experience here. Um, And then we're going to open up for some audience questions. And if you guys are shy, then I've got more questions for these fellows. So overall, we're going to do a lot. We're under the lights. The music's been cued. You got the, the, the stage is set. We're on it. You got the cameras. You got groupies. You got an audience, nobody jump into it, okay? There'll be no body surfing or any of that stuff tonight. So I'm going to start with Claiborne, and we're going to talk about just defining leadership, just how you define leadership. Does it need a definition? Do you have a definition for leadership? Is it something that you've thought about in terms of just that category of what that is? And for all of you, all of your answers, make sure you're talking into your microphone, so... Like a rock star. Uh, I don't. <clears throat> I really don't have a definition. Uh, I look for attributes that I think great leaders have, and, and when I see those, that's when I start formulating in my own mind: "Gee, this person, uh, woman or man, um, is a leader." And and the types of attributes that I that I look for um, are somewhere along the lines of. One, if you're a leader, um, you, you treat people like you want to be treated. Uh, and you think that's easy, but you would be stunned uh, at the number of people who get um, positions who change almost imperceptibly and, and sometimes quickly uh, and morph into something different. Uh, and people see it, especially the folks who work for them or follow them, and it's, um, it's, it's a negative. So, so uh, that ability to, to treat everyone like you want to be treated is important. Um, r- related to that uh, would be check your ego at the door. Um, uh, the leader who's, who's got to be right all the time, um, is, it's, a, it's a total turnoff and, and uh, not, not, not really a leader. And you won't get out of people what you need to get out of them. Um, uh, a small one, but it gets really big. Uh, is is uh, always give credit. Great leaders always give credit. Uh, in fact, I, I was just talking to a guy this weekend uh, when I was duck hunting. He was in the running to run a really big public company. Um, and he left about 15 years ago and has had a really terrific private career. Um, and I said, gee, Nat, why did you leave? Um, and he says, you know, I was in a meeting. One of the guys I was in competition with um, stole an idea from someone else of the company because I heard him get the idea the day before. He repackaged it, and in the meeting I was with him in the subsequent day, um, he comes out and, and regurgitates it and claims it as his own. And I thought, gee, that guy might be the head of this company because he was on a fast track like my friend was, and he says, didn't want to be there and left. Uh, and it's a stunning turnoff when people do that, uh, and leaders who do that grab ideas, repackage them, their, their own, not someone else's, it's a, it's a, it's a turn-off. Sense of humor, got to keep a sense of humor. 
uh, in this whole thing because there's a lot of ups and downs in life, a lot of unexpected things that you, you, you think you, you've seen it all and suddenly something comes out of left field, typically bad, uh, and you've got to be able to deal with it and, and keep kind of perspective uh, in it. Um, is this a veiled illusion or a reference to low oil prices right now? <laughs> well, uh, yeah, that's part of it. Uh, <laughs> other things have, that's, this has developed over time and then suddenly is here in spades, but there's other things that just happen in, overnight. Uh, and you just have to kind of keep that in, in perspective. And then probably uh, lastly, and you can make it a long list, but but uh, got to be cool under pressure. Um, it's amazing how people follow you and your actions and the intonation in your voice and how you react. Um, and if you're a little panicky uh, in a situation which, which can be tense uh, and which requires response, um, then that quickly permeates an organization. So uh, if you have qualities like that, this, this kind of humble, treat people well, um, and probably lastly, you gotta be decisive. You gotta be seen to get all the facts on the table in a decision and, and, and then be really fact-driven, then decide. And, and even the best leaders are going to be wrong pretty frequently. Um, but if you make a decision pretty quickly, you're down the road, other things have happened, you're in a position again to decide, and it's much better than being stuck back where you were. So even though you, you have all the facts, you may, or you have facts, you may not have all of them, uh, but decide. So this kind of decisive thing, I think, is, is, um, is also important. So if you have those, I think there's a reasonable shot that, that you're going to fulfill your job as a leader reasonably well. Okay. Hugh, how about you? Now, you can hold on to each. Everybody gets their own microphone. Hugh, just your definition well, of leadership. There's or you nothing can build, left to say. Yeah, I was about to say, you can, you can build on what Claiborne's <laughs> talked about there. So. No, I, I agree with everything Claiborne has said. Um, on the first point... You know, treating people with respect on how, you know, treat people how you would expect others to treat you. If you don't have that, you don't have what I think is the foundation that is required for any leader or really any person, and that's trust. If you don't have somebody's trust, if they don't, you know, they don't believe that you're going to treat them with respect, you're not going to have their trust, and you're not going to be able to lead the organization, no matter what kind of organization it is you're not going to be able to have that trust. Um, calm under pressure, you know, I, I, that's certainly certainly right. Steady steady leadership, you've got to have a good sense of humor. Um, you know, you can't be a jokester, you know, but you got to, you know, when you, we've all heard of situational leadership and, you know, when, when times are really tough, you have to step up your game in terms of, the type of leader you are and, and the, the type of challenges that uh, you're under, the type of challenges that you have to put the organization under to accomplish the objective, and of course doing it above board with integrity. And uh, uh, so, you know, that's a few comments on top of Claiborne's. That's good. Ray. Well, I'll, I'll take a little bit different perspective. If you're CEO of a publicly traded company and you've got people depending on you to take care of what they've invested in the company and the assets, uh, I define leadership is by never having to say you're sorry to your shareholders because you made the wrong call at the wrong time, led us down the wrong path, or you didn't work hard enough. So, so, and you're not a leader if nobody follows you. So always look, always look around <laughs> and see who's following you. And uh, that'll tell you what kind of leader you are. Um, as far as defining leadership, uh, Roby, I would just tell you, you'll, you know it when you see it. And so uh, we, I'm sure we've all seen that. And, you know, another question could be, are leaders born or are they made? And I think they're both. I think uh, leaders are developed. And that's they're mentored, they're trained. Uh, and, you know, there's, there's certainly instinct has a lot to do with being a great leader. Mm -hmm. so. Let's stick with you, Ray, and work our way back around. Let's talk about some leadership experiences that you have faced. Maybe harken back or think back to a very trying time, a difficult time, a big time decision or experience that you had in business where you, you, you utilize leadership and you look back on it now and you say to yourself, 
that that was a good moment for me in terms of leadership. Well, I I think leaders need to lead by example. And so when I think back over my career, quite frankly, it starts on the farm. And whenever your your father is not at home and you're responsible for live animals, bad things happen if you don't do your job. Okay? And consequences are severe also <laughs> if you don't do your job. So that's a form of leadership, and you learn that at a very young age, and it served me well. You learn responsibility, accountability, and you learn to do your job. And quite frankly, you learn how to think in situations where you haven't, that you don't know all the answers. You learn to think your way through problems because you have to. So, and then um, out of college, my first uh, uh, assignment was in a uh, large paper mill in Bogalusa, Louisiana. And it was actually going to be shut down. Uh, Fortune magazine wrote an article that said it was the uh, most inefficient paper mill in the United States, and it was going to be shut down. The whole community and the mill rallied around it to save it, but it required $500 million of investment, which I was fortunate enough to become a part of that team. But when you make those kind of investments in automated facility, you go from 600 people to 200 people. And I was part of a team that selected who was the 200 people in a union environment. And that's tough because you're dealing with people's livelihood, you're trying to be fair in how you assess the skills and what it takes to be able to be successful. And so I was right out of college uh, doing that, learning that uh, at the front line. And then my next assignment was uh, at the paper mill in Pine Bluff, Arkansas, the old Dirks Mill. It was. Uh, it was a very troubled facility. I was sent there to turn it around and dealing with an old mill, inefficient, trying to rebuild it from the inside out and run it and, quite frankly, get the union on board with saving the mill. So those that builds character. Mm -hmm. And a lot of days you think, why did you sign up for these things? But you, <laughs> but you don't look back. You just keep going. Yeah. So, And a quick side note, Bogalusa, Louisiana? Bogalusa, Louisiana. Where is that? It's uh, just, uh, it's about 100 miles north of New Orleans. Okay. Covington, right. north of Covington. Got it. Across Never Lake heard of it before. That's good. All right. Hugh, Muddy I, waters is the, what the word means. And how about, Hugh, and how about I take away something from you? You can't talk about ice storms. How about that? So, in describing a leadership experience that you've dealt with. Well, we've all had those, right? Yeah. Ice storms. You can if you want to. Uh, no, I, you know, the challenging, uh, probably the most challenging issue that I've dealt with in my career was, um, you know, it's, it's a technical issue with regard to the energy system. It's called the system agreement, but it's a, it's a federally energy regulatory commission administered contract on how all of the energy operating companies in Louisiana, Mississippi, Arkansas, and Texas plan, build, operate their power plants and bulk power transmission system and how we share certain costs, allocate certain costs among the operating companies. And it is a, uh, it's, sometimes it's referred to a pooling agreement. And other holding company utilities have got these pooling agreements across the country and they're, they're very common and it makes sense because you can operate the system as a much larger system and get the economies of scale uh, as opposed to, you know, a individual states individual operating companies in a more balkanized fashion. However, our system became sort of a litigious hornet's nest over the past 35, 40 years. And the straw that, you know, a year after I got up here, the straw that sort of broke the camel's back that ultimately led to a, a bad decision for my customers in Arkansas was the FERC in Washington made a decision that was inconsistent with the interests of 700,000 of my customers in Arkansas. And the, uh, the energy system had been under this system for since 1951. And uh, each operating company has the, you know, the, the uh, option to withdraw, but it takes eight years to withdraw. And the day the order was issued at the FERC, was the day I issued my notice to my peers in Entergy that we were exiting the agreement. And so that led to eight years of 
just a lot of slogging through a lot of regulatory proceedings, a lot of litigation, a lot of, you know, assembling the team. And it's, it's just, it's not just a team within Arkansas, but it's a system-wide team. People in Louisiana, Mississippi, Texas, Arkansas, all working together to that common objective of, you know, we had never operated. Everybody, any, every employee in the energy system had never operated outside of this agreement. So it was new to everybody. And uh, you know we had options on where we wanted to, where we wanted to go, but it was a, a a very challenging time. the The future was uncertain. We just knew we couldn't go back to how we how we operated in the past. And uh, make a long story short, it's turned out good for the company and good for our customers. So um, uh, a learning experience, certainly from my perspective, and and many of the folks in the company that uh, that participated in that. Clayburn, how about you? Probably uh, Hurricane Katrina. Uh, it was 05. I'd been on the job for 10 years, so I knew how to run a company. Uh, the hurricane came, and it, it uh, shut down a refinery in New Orleans, flooded it, knocked out all of our production, destroyed platforms in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, and the day after, we learned we had 83 people trapped in our building in downtown New Orleans. And... New Orleans was flooded and lawless, uh, and and the half were employees, half weren't, because people would come to our building because we had a generator uh, to ride out storms, and we had a, a man with with uh, diabetes that if he didn't get insulin in two 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 and a half days he'd die. A pregnant woman and, and six people over seventy years old there. Um, food short, ran out after twenty four hours, and and water was running out. Um, and there was, we had to figure out how to get them out. Um, and, and it was just a extraordinarily uh, difficult thing. And on the fly, uh, you know, all the people who you're supposed to call to come rescue people like that uh, were tied up. Um, so no, sorry, you know, otherwise occupied. And, and so we had to put together a, a group uh, of, um, ended up putting up a group of 10 people uh, led by a guy from El Dorado, Ashley Mason, uh, who had mustered out of the Army uh, Special Forces and was doing some contract work for the government. And he said uh, he'd do it and uh, made the decision in 20 minutes and put together the team. And to make a long story short, um, on that, we learned about this on a Wednesday and Friday morning, he got in there and then um, mm. saved this guy's life. And, and so that night, um, I'm going, wow, that was 83 people, saved a life. Um, people came out. Uh, that, that's quite a feat. I never have done that before. And the next morning I woke up and I got a call from a guy. I says, Clayton, we got a problem. I said, man, we don't have a problem. We just saved 83 people, got them out of New Orleans, <laughs> saved a guy's life. And and uh, it was we, we really did a pretty good job of this. I feel really good about myself. He says, nope. Uh, we got a big uh, oil spill uh, refinery in New Orleans, and um, it's probably 25,000 barrels, and it probably covers 5,000 homes. And I said, yep, we got a problem. <laughs> um, and so we had to go to work that day, uh, and it had never been happened. It would never happen before. And, of course, we had a billion-dollar class action lawsuit. And, and so it was one thing that could have sunk the company during my tenure there. Uh, and... I uh, just through 10 years of running a company, knew how to deal with it and, and dealt with that and, and, and got that whole thing solved in 13 months of litigation. So, and then our, of course our production came back on. Uh, it, it had happened to me, if I had been in the job for a year or two, I wouldn't have done nearly as good a job. Mm -hmm. um, so, so experience, you, you learn. experience and tenacity. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely, trusting your instincts. Um, as, as I think Ray said, very, very important. You, you learn to trust them over time. Your gut will tell you over time. It doesn't initially, uh, but after a while, in fact, you know the answer a lot of times when you have to make a decision before you get all the facts, but you have to get the facts, and you have to look at them, you have to make sure you're right before you do it, but eight out of ten times you know what to do. Uh, in that case, we didn't know what to do because we've never done it before, but we figured it out. Yep. You might have come to you first on this next question. I want you all three to talk about uh, role models that you have had over the years that you have looked up to as leaders. It can be famous people. It can be people that you just know that maybe this audience doesn't know. But tell me a little bit about them, 
what in, what did they inspire in you in terms of leadership and understanding what it takes to be a leader? And um, so just share the, that's, those types of stories with this audience here. Uh, nobody in the audience probably knows this person, but um, uh, early in my career, I had an opportunity to be a, an executive assistant to one of our CEOs in Louisiana, uh, 25, almost 30, going on 30 years ago. But, but he was a, certainly a role model for me, a mentor for me for a, a number, of, number of years. Um, he had a he had all the characteristics that that Claiborne was talking about that we talked about he he exhibited the level of uh, humility uh, you know you could you could trust him with your life uh, he was calm he was cool he was serious when it needed to be you could joke with him just just one of those fatherly figures that uh, we all have people like that in our lives that uh, made a huge impact on me uh, in terms of how I watched him, how I saw him behave in really difficult situations, um, and uh, you know, just learned a lot from him over the years, and and was able to, uh, you know, talk to him afterwards after he retired as well. So, um, his name is Jim Kane. He was a, a CEO of uh, Louisiana Power and Light and Nopsy uh, for many years. Okay, how about you, Ray? Well, I would uh, have to start with uh, quote your, my parents' uh, expectations. It was not an option to do well and perform at whatever it was. Whatever it was, you were expected to do at your best, and that was perfection. And if it wasn't perfect, you got to do it again tomorrow, and and practice. But uh, and I've been quite frankly very blessed with uh, great educational role models throughout my life. And uh, then when you get in the work environment, this, this small town in Bogalusa, Louisiana, it was amazing the talent that was in that mill for a young person like myself coming there to be assigned to a $500 million modernization project that, that hadn't been $500 million spent when the mill was built. That was in the 1900s. And to get to rub shoulders with people that had been in the business 40 years, quite frankly, designing plants, then starting up plants, and then making them profitable. Those are the three keys. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and the last one's the most important, is, is being able to make a profit at, at what you're making. And um, then, I would, then I would say the, I was always taught to learn something from everybody, whatever it was, whether it was good or bad. You can learn something from everybody. You mostly look for the good, but in my previous uh, assignment with Gaylord Container Corporation, I tell the joke that that uh, my previous CEO, I learned a lot of things, chairman and CEO, Marvin Pomerantz, a good man, but I learned a lot of things not to do by watching Marvin. <laughs> and and it, Marvin was a gentleman that woke up every morning and the glass was always more than half full and the market was always going to save us. We were in the liner board and box business. And so he never met a deal that he didn't fall in love with. So I learned to fall in love with just your wife and never a deal and always be able to say no and walk away. And if you can't make it work on a piece of paper, don't do it because you're going to destroy value rather than create value. And you're talking about saying no to the deal, not your wife, right? You're right. <laughs> yeah, okay. Just making sure. On <laughs> you're that. right. Yeah, my wife doesn't like no. <laughs> but uh, so there, there are people that you learn from, and, and we've all had those experiences, and treasure the opportunities. Uh, one of the reasons that, uh, uh, you know, a mentor of mine, a gentleman by the name of Bob Carter, took me under his wing in wood procurement in Bogalusa and carried me into the forest to the landowners and taught me the whole procurement. Because when you're a pulp and paper company and you didn't own a single tree, but you needed 600,000 tons of wood a year, you better know where it comes from. And so uh, I've been just been very blessed with, with great role models and leaders and good and bad. And, uh, and you know, it's, uh, the key is never is being smart enough to ask enough questions because you've had the experiences and never make the fatal error.